Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. It is a pleasure to introduce Rabbi David Saperstein, designated by Newsweek magazine, and as he told us last night, his mother, as the most influential rabbi in America, and by the Washington Post as the quintessential religious lobbyist on Capitol Hill. For 40 years as the director of the Religious Action Center for Reform Judaism, Rabbi Saperstein represented to Congress and the administration the Reform Jewish movement, the largest segment, of course, of American Jewry. Under Rabbi Saperstein, writes J.J. Goldberg in his book, Jewish Power, the Religious Action Center has become one of the most powerful Jewish bodies in Washington, perhaps, perhaps second only to AIPAC. During the second term of the Obama administration, Rabbi Saperstein served as the United States Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom, carrying out his responsibilities as the country's chief diplomat on religious freedom issues. In this capacity, he served as a principal advisor to Secretary Kerry and President Obama on issues of international religious freedom and traveled widely as America's advocate for religious freedom across the globe. 2019 to 2020, Rabbi Saperstein served as the president of the World Union for Progressive Judaism, the international arm of the Reform Jewish movement. By the way, David, your successor, Sergio Bergman, on occasion uh, is living here in Brooklyn and Davins with us when he's not traveling around through the, Ukra the Ukraine as part of his efforts uh, right now. Uh, I think many of you know that Rabbi Saperstein is an attorney. He taught seminars on church state law. There are a lot of attorneys in this congregation for some reason. <laughs> he taught seminars on church state law and on comparative Jewish and American law for 35 years at Georgetown University Law Center and continues his academic work as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's Foreign Service School and Center for Jewish Civilization and as a distinguished fellow at the P.M. Glynn Institute at Australian Catholic University. Rabbi Saperstein is married to Ellen Weiss, an award-winning journalist. He has two sons, Danny, a musician, and Ari, an artist and a writer. In his book, Thunder in America, network news correspondent Bob, is it Faw? Bob Faw, uh, wrote of Rabbi Saperstein, quote, Saperstein learned from political masters. His energy is almost legendary. No one around him worked longer hours. No one darted in and out of more meetings. Once he'd taken on an assignment, he always guided it safely home to completion. And with that, welcome Rabbi David Saperstein. I uh, put the mics in the less dangerous position. Oh, we'll put those here, right? <laughs> and I'm going to give you the, uh, the ear mic. There you go. Thank you. What a delight to be back here. I have many fond memories what? of this congregation uh, tomorrow. I'll have a chance to share some of those as well. But it is a special, special pleasure for me to, uh, to be here, particularly during this year that, Rabbi, is your 25th year here? It, it evokes for me just an observation about the congregational clergy person. I want to submit to you that it may be one of the most unique professional positions anywhere on earth. And I'm delighted if somebody comes up to me afterwards as I make this argument to suggest uh, one that would be of the same nature. But there is no profession that I can think of anywhere that allows one human being to interact as fully and completely with other people who choose to enter that relationship from birth to death, in good times, in bad times, able to shape the values, the personality, the life's path that others who engage with him will live out. It's something really extraordinary. 
And now by this point, you've officiated at the life cycle ceremonies of at least three generations of some of the uh, families that you've done. What, a, what an extraordinary profession that is, and what a wonderful job the rabbi has done of this. Um, a wonderful teacher, a champion of our camping system, for which we are deeply grateful, a passionate champion of social justice that has always been part of this congregation. I was actually uh, uh, in Brooklyn at the time that you launched the first homeless shelter. Um, many, many years ago, and you've carried that on and expanded this extraordinary work. We're deeply appreciative of what you've done for RAC New York, of your efforts on the parole reform bill last time, of you know, those of you who are going to be involved this year with uh, RAC New York's priority. Uh, RAC, for those of you who don't know, is a religious action center, our national entity that I ran for so long. Uh, and. Uh, in many states across the country now, we have state-organized RACs in, uh, from California to New York uh, who are doing tremendous work at the state level. So uh, re in the work that you're going to be doing on environmental issues, climate addressing climate change, all of this is really remarkable. The uh, adoption of, uh, and this was not the first time, you've done it in several iterations earlier in the history here, but adopting refugees who are fleeing persecution, something really extraordinary. And it speaks to what my topic is tonight, which is the role that social justice has always played in Jewish life. Um, it has been central to who we are about. From the first moment that Abraham confronts God over the possibility God may destroy, the innocent in Sodom, we are taught that to be a Jew is to speak out wherever we see injustice wherever we see needless suffering. And if we can do that with God, how much more so with human rulers are we empowered to speak out for those values? So why are Jews and Reformed Jews and Jews in America so concerned about or should be so concerned about social justice? Let me suggest three reasons. First, because God says so. Is it not self-evident that we cannot fulfill our destiny to be a light to the nations, that we cannot respond to God's central call to us to be a holy people if we retreat from the struggles for justice, peace, and equality in our nation and in our world? The work of tikkun olam must play a powerful role in our Jewish life simply because it is right, and God calls us to that task of righteousness. 3,000 years of Jewish mothers and fathers have insisted that we Jews do not continue for continuity's sake alone. We do not exist for existence sake alone, but are called for a holy purpose and a holy mission to be God's partners in shaping a better and more hopeful world. You shall be holy for the eternal your God is holy, God commands in Leviticus. And how does God tell us we can be holy? By feeding the hungry removing the stumbling block before the blind, speaking out against injustice, paying the labor a fair and timely wage, creating courts of justice in a marketplace that is fair and honest. As a great Orthodox scholar, Isidore Tversky, um, once wrote, one cannot claim to be a God-intoxicated Jew without having a passion for social justice. Second, in a nation where we make up a shrinking percentage of the population, it is clear that we cannot go it alone, that there is no issue central to our hearts in which we can prevail if we not part, are not part of a broader coalition of decency. The fundamental rule of coalitional politics, that in order to have a friend, you must be a friend, requires that we galvanize our efforts on the broad domestic and foreign policy challenges of our nation both because it is the right thing to do, but also because we cannot expect others to stand for us on Israel, against anti-Semitism on any particular issue, if we ignore their most passionate concerns on which we agree. And third, we cannot meet the challenge of Jewish continuity without addressing the central role of social justice in our community. Polls have repeatedly shown that commitment to or involvement in social justice is far and away the most common organizing principle of American Jewry's Jewish identity, including the communities that are the targets of our efforts, the young, 
and the unaffiliated. By definition, study and worship are not likely to be the, the way that uh, unaffiliated Jews express their identity. But social justice often is a gateway to bring them into Jewish life. And no program of Jewish continuity that does not build on that reality will succeed. And there are those who say, wait a minute, stick to religion, stay out of social justice. Or why do you prioritize social justice over study and worship, spirituality? To all of those, we say, this is not a Jewish question. We have to do them all. To choose between them would offer inauthentic Jewish answers to the challenges that we face. For otherwise, we would have to answer unanswerable Jewish questions. Think about how you would answer this. Which is more Jewish, wearing a kippah or sheltering the homeless? Which is more urgent, to feed matzah to our children on Pesach or feed the, charging, the starving children dying in Yemen or in Mariupol? Which is a more religious act, to welcome with joy, as we have done tonight, the Sabbath queen, or to welcome with love the refugee for fleeing persecution, as you have done in this congregation. To pray with fervor, with kavanah and Shabbat, or to express our indignation in the face of injustice. Our job is to weave together Torah, Avadah, Gemilo, Chassadim, study, worship, and social justice, acts of loving kindness, into a stronger tapestry, indeed a luminous talit of Jewish life. And if this addresses the why of social justice, Jewish social justice, let us think through together a little bit about how to think about the what of Jewish social justice. I wish I had time this evening to discuss the Ukraine and the extraordinary figure um, of Zelensky, his Jewish president of a beleaguered country that has been targeted by a dictatorial superpower standing up to protect the innocent, standing up for freedom, challenging the conscience of the world, living out Jewish values every single day. I'd like to talk about what's happening in Israel now, both in terms of the terrible terrorist attacks and the fascinating development in Israeli political system. I hope most of you caught this, but the 61 to 59 margin the coalition allows it to hold together has now had a defector that's gone over and it's 60-60. It's not clear what the future of this coalition is going to be. It's possible we may face another round of elections for the last time, if you remember, in 18 months. What an extraordinary balagan that was. That's a technical, political term for those of you who are unfamiliar with it. This is really an extraordinary moment to watch what happens. But keep in mind, it actually takes 61 to vote the government down. And now it's 60-60. They can't do it. Or the option is it can also, by majority, by 61, vote a replacement government for the current one. And it can't do that either because it's 60-60. This is going to lead to a misjockeying of both sides trying to get people to come over uh, to their side and a government that has done so well, um, somewhat paralyzed now, trying to get one vote for any particular uh, piece of legislation they're going to have. And I wish I had time, of course, to talk about what has been the RAC and the movement's priority about civil rights and uh, fighting racism um, in America and the criminal justice system. I want to commend you on the role with RAC, with RAC New York in terms of the parole reform um, efforts that uh, you were engaged in. Now, what you did here is really a source of pride for us. Um, here, all I will say is watching today as KBJ, KBJ was sworn in and her moving speech at this time and recognizing we're witnessing the first black women in American history who rather than being enslaved is going to sit on the highest court representing rule of law in America. What an extraordinary moment it has. But I don't have time to talk about any of those. <laughs> so let me instead set the context to think in general about things, and I'll give you a few examples of the point I'm making. And I turn back 2,000 years in Jewish history to what is arguably the single most famous aphorism in all of Jewish history. 
If I am not for myself, who should be for me? If, if, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Not even who am I, what am I? If not, now when? But of course in Hebrew it's this conjunction linking together the idea of being for ourselves and being for others, being bound together and both requiring a response to the question, if not now, when? And I want to make an argument that it should be a leitmotif for the way we think through our responsibility as a reformed Jewish movement, as a Jewish community, individually as Jews, recognizing we pick and choose our priorities by the passion of our hearts in our particular value system and our political views that we may have. The only sin for a Jew is to sit on the sidelines and do nothing. Uh, when there is injustice and suffering and evil in the world. But how you go about doing it is your choice, but as a community, these are all our values here. We must not retreat as for Israel's sake, for the Jewish community's sake, for America's sake, for the world's sake, um, from either the particular universalist component of our uh, uh, social justice agenda. So a few examples. You can't worry about Israel without worrying about American foreign policy. Isn't that obvious? And it can't be that Israel's foreign policy can be dictated only about what happens to Israel. What happens to Israel has to do with what America does in the entire region and what America does in the world. We've witnessed America really beginning in the Obama administration and deeply um, uh, 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 strengthened in the Trump administration and somewhat continued, although a little bit moved back the other way. Uh, we tell you, despite the efforts all of them made on the international scene, in many ways we've withdrawn from a role in many areas around the world. And in every place we've done that, China and Russia have really moved in. I travel the globe widely, and you can see China building infrastructure where America used to do it, providing aid where America used to do it, Russia playing a role in the Middle East. Russia is the only power that is talking to both the Sunni and the Shia Muslims playing a crucial role in Lebanon and in Syria, which, by the way, is why Israel is so reluctant to um, uh, condemn uh, Russia as strongly as many of us might have hoped they would have done. Russian soldiers are on their border. Russian soldiers allow them to function in areas that the Russian soldiers control against terrorist targets um, that would otherwise endanger, endanger Israel. Um, a tough choice for a political leader to make. But America, in, in terms of its role, has to figure out ways to counteract and it can't do it thinking narrowly about Israel. It's the broader agenda as well. You can't think about Israel without worrying about the, Israel's military policy. The weapons that we develop, where we deploy them, what our global strategies are, all of that are going, is going to affect, um, is going to affect uh, Israel and Israel's security as well. And you can't worry about military policy without worrying about the proliferation of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, the so-called weapons of mass destruction. The threat from Iran, whatever your view on the JCPOA might have been in the Obama era, Iran remains an existential threat to Israel, an intensely destabilizing force in the entire region. President Obama's enormous increase of the Bush administration's level of sanctions brought Iran to the table for the JCPOA, with Israel's military intelligence political leaders deeply split over the accord. President Trump's withdrawal from the JCPOA and further expansion of the sanctions neither led to the regime change, as Prime Minister Netanyahu predicted, nor has it slowed, let alone halted, Iran's uh, renewed pursuit of the nuclear military potential, as President Trump had uh, predicted once Iran followed the U.S. out of the accord. It remains to be seen what the new treaty will do. We should soon see the answer to that question. And whether it's going to, going to be better for the U.S., for Israel, for uh, our allies uh, to have whatever this next treaty is, then the status quo or not. And what Israel will do if the new accord fails to be enacted or fails in Israel's view to meet their security needs. But even if the agreement turns out to be effective, we kind of miss the dangers of the spread of nuclear technologies and other non-conventional technologies and weapons to other areas of the globe. 
The potential of a nuclearized conflict between India and Pakistan remains a constant threat to world peace. And extremists in Pakistan and many other areas are working hard to obtain non-conventional uh, capabilities and would be likely to be more inclined to use them because it would be very hard to identify a non-state actor that actually uses them and to retaliate um, against them. Unless we act more forcefully to stop the spread of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, Israel and the U.S. may well face such weapons um, in the future. And I'm particularly proud of the fact that at the Religious Action Center in the 1990s, we played a key role in drafting an even stronger role in successfully advocating for the passage, even over President Bush, the father, President Bush's veto of this legislation, the strongest anti-proliferation legislation regarding chemical and biological weapons that the US had at that time. And this is an issue that has special resonance for the Jewish people. Um, Samuel Pizar, the eloquent Holocaust survivor, said an extraordinary speech at the second gathering of Holocaust survivors given before in the Knesset, the Israeli Knesset building. Um, here with the authority of the numbers engraved on our arms, we cry out the commandments of six million innocent souls, one and a half million children, of whom I used to be one, never again. From where, if not from us, will come the warning of a new combination of technology and brutality that can transform the entire planet into a crematorium. Halting this is good for Israel, good for America, good for the world, the universal in particular, are bound together, and you cannot worry about Israel without worrying about global energy policy. It was a lever that allowed the oil, uh, the Arab countries to manipulate the foreign policy of many countries across the globe into anti-Israel posture for decades. Things are beginning to turn around, and President Trump deserves credit um, for the Abraham Accords. I hope that this administration will use those accords to try and get the uh, Arab countries to make it a regional priority to move some resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. Um, and you can't worry about energy policy without worrying about environmental po uh, policy. Um, I, some, many experts predict that uh, there may the next war, shooting war, in the Middle East may be over the shrinking shortage of water, the shortage of water and shrinking supplies of water in the, uh, in the region. Um, uh, and we see in Ukraine what reliance on fossil fuels has done in terms of uh, both military and uh, diplomatic um, policies uh, here. And down the road, the, with the Jews who are involved, you know, like Dayenu and Gazon and Kojal, um, in efforts to really address climate change, uh, what they're going to do 50 years down the road when we do free ourselves of dependence on um, fossil fuels, uh, in its entirety, then this will be a major contribution to Israel's well-being, to America's well-being, the world's well-being. Um, just a word more about climate change, because I think you know as well as I do that for millennials and Gen Z, this is such a vital, important issue. And we Jews know why we should be involved. The earth is the eternals and the fullness thereof. What we own, we own in a trust relationship with God requiring that we protect God's creation, not just for ourselves and our world, but for the generations to come. That idea of responsibility to those generations is one of religious, the, commu the religious community's greatest contribution to ethical thought over the centuries. For Jews, the vast array of Talmudic environment uh, regulations protecting water and air, stopping, uh, uh, con uh, insisting on conservation of resources, um, the belts of green planted around urban areas all testify uh, to the obligation of Jews to address such environmental concerns. But of course, the urgency that we face today challenges our ability to apply those values to the world in which we dwell, a crisis whose complexities we only begin to see. And I say that literally because we are the First generation, those of us my age and others of a similar, we're the first generation in all of human history to actually see our world. The first, the image of the whole earth taken from outer space is the defining image, the icon, the revelation of our generation. 
No other humans before us had experienced this. As we see it from afar, this blue-green home, its great forest and seas, its green and blue, its mountains and creatures, it truly is sweet and precious. And as God saw it, he told, and it was good. But just at the very moment that we see this, with wonder and clarity and awe, we are suddenly confronted by the startling evidence of its peril, of the damage being, wrought, being wrought by our own hands, our indifference, our selfishness, affecting all of us, global warming, ozone depletion, uh, escalating eradication of entire species of life, destruction of our rainforest, runaway world population. Um, uh, current studies indicate that things are going bad far faster than was even predicted by the alarmists 10 or 15 years ago. Melting polar ice, rising sea levels, increasing patterns of extreme weather, weather intense hurricanes, forest fires, climate zones that are shifting into arid or flood-prone regions. Um, this week, this very week, the UN's premier research arm, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, concluded that things are literally spinning out of control. It's now or never, Secretary General Guterres warned, Unless action is taken soon, we're going to have cities underwater, unprecedented heat waves, terrifying storms, widespread water shortage, extinction of up to a million species of plants and animals. This is not fiction or exaggeration, he said. It is what science tells us will result from our current energy policies. And you and I, we feel this personally. This is our home. Everyone we have ever known and loved lives on this earth, lived on this earth, or will live on this earth. Every child or grandchild of yours or mine will inherit this home, however we leave it. And this, above all, if things go really bad, there will be no Noah's Ark that will protect Jews while others perish. We are all in this together. You cannot worry about oppressed Jews in foreign lands or the spread of global anti-Semitism without worrying about uh, religious freedom and tolerance and without confronting religious persecution and hate speech and hate crimes both in America and across the globe. You can't do it just by fighting anti-Semitism if the atmosphere is inculcating this and legitimizes it for other groups as well. This is a serious challenge for, uh, for us, for all of us. You cannot worry about Jewish refugees without worrying about refugee policy more broadly. We Jews have been the quintessential refugee community in the history of the world. From Abraham leaving his home to go to Canaan, Jacob because of famine, fleeing Israel, going to Egypt, Moses leading his people to slavery, to freedom, and the Promised Land. Jews throughout history who were banished or exiled or forced to flee um, uh, by religious prejudice and, and uh, military uh, destruction of the areas in which they live, seeking simply safety and security and freedom. And where they did find that, they flourished and added immensely to the societies of which they were a part. It was all too rare in, hi in Jewish history. But America, what an extraordinary country for Jews. And our dedication to America's values, the lessons of our history, um, I think is one of the reasons American Jewry has given such overwhelming support for a more generous and compassionate refugee policy and explains a virtually uh, universal Jewish anathema at the growing demonization of, ref of refugees that we have seen over the last years um, uh, here and the efforts to bar refugees from Muslim majority countries and to drastically cut the, um, uh, the numbers of refugees that would be admitted. And a point of personal observation in terms of Jewish ethics. I visited refugee camps in some of the worst, most imperiled areas across the globe. Everywhere, it is the children, malnourished, unable to survive unremitting strains, who so often die first. In the Sadist service, and this is a congregation that produced not just the president of, uh, excuse me, who was led uh, earlier, not just by the president of uh, the URJ, um, but the, the head of the Central Conference of American Rabbis, Harrah Person, was raised in this congregation. And I really hope 
that every one of you has taken a look at the beautiful new uh, reform movement Haggadah that she was a key person in putting together. Uh, and I hope many of you have an occasion to use it. Not too late to order it um, <laughs> if, you've not yet, if you've not yet done so. But in the state of service, many these days, and it is embodied in that, I've got to lift up the allusion to Shifra and Pua, the Egyptian midwives who defied Pharaoh's order, uh, orders to commit genocide against the Jews by killing the newborn males. How can you not think about what's happening in the Ukraine when you hear this? How can you not think about what's happening to Uyghur Muslims and Rohingya Muslims um, when you read this? What is our responsibility to be Shifra and Pua wherever we can through direct or indirect efforts to protect the innocent? But it is the children who living in poverty, displaced from homes to refugee camps, caught in the midst of violent conflict, far too often the children who die first. And the global refugee crisis now, the largest in all of recorded human history of displaced populations and refugees um, here from Myanmar to Africa to Syria to the 8 to 10 million displaced in Ukraine, 4 million of them refugees who have fled their countries, pricks the conscience of all good people. And the image of the dead that we have seen, elderly people, children lying dead in the streets of Ukraine, who can ever forget those images anymore? Who can forget the image of three-year-old um, uh, Ilam Qurdi? Uh, the, the Syrian refugee 10 years ago, um, lying dead on a Turkish speech, his five-year-old old brother Galib and his mother Rehan perishing nearby. We dare not stand by the blood of a single child more, not in the refugee camps, not in the streets of our cities with the homeless, not those being trafficked in brothels or sweatshops in nations across the globe. The Nobel Prize winning poet Nellie Sachs, a German Jewish refugee who fled Nazi persecution, wrote of the Holocaust, O night of the weeping children, O night of the children branded for death, sleep may not enter here. Terrible nursemaids have usurped the place of mothers. Instead of mother's milk, panic suckles the little ones. Yesterday, mothers still drew sleep toward them like a white moon. There was a doll with cheeks de rouge by kisses in one arm, the stuffed pet already brought to life by love, and in the other, now blows the wind of dying, blows the shifts over the hair that no one will ever comb again. And you can't worry about hate crimes, you can't worry about anti-Semitism without addressing racism, hate speech on our internet, in our political discourse, um, those who have been targeted, Jews are the most frequently targeted religious group. African Americans are targeted at twice the rate even of Jews as the primary targets of hate crimes in America. And make no mistake about it, exactly what hate crimes are about here. The damage done by hate crimes on America, on the victims, is more than mere acts of violence. They're more than murders, beatings, arsons, desecration. Hate crimes are nothing less than attacks on the values that are the pillars of our republic and the guarantors of our freedom. They're a betrayal of the promise of America. They erode our national well-being, and those who commit these crimes do so fully intending to tear at the too often frayed threads of diversity that bind us together and make us strong. They seek to divide and conquer. They seek to tear us apart, pitting American against American, fomenting violence and civil discord. What's been extraordinary is how the religious communities of, matter, of America have gathered together to fight against this, to stand together, to clean up graffiti, to repair um, uh, desecrations, to stand with the victims and their communities is true in Tree of Life in Pittsburgh and Poway um, and uh, in Texas uh, here. This has been something extraordinary about America, and in doing so, we are modeling the very world that we are trying to create. Do you remember the remarkable verses in the book of Esther when Mordecai beseeches Esther and says, go lobby King Ahasuerus on behalf of your people? And she first demurs, and Mordecai urges her to have courage, saying, who knows whether your elevation 
to the royal house to access power and influence was not for such a time as this. For such a time as this, might not we see the unprecedented freedom given us in North America at such a remarkable crossroads of human history, see our attainment of wealth, power, and influence in the world's most important nation, attainments beyond the wildest imagination of those who came before granted us for such a time as this. The Midrash then comments that this remarkable woman lobbyist, Queen Esther, decides she will engage in advocacy on behalf of the values and interests of her people and says, it says, I shall go then and God shall lend me God's right hand and left hand with which the universe was created. It's a stunning image. It's actually the only time in the Midrash I've ever seen this image of curves. Often God is described in anthropomorphic terms. God does this with the left hand. God does this with the right hand. But only in going to plead for justice do we find the image that our hands are the hands of God. My friends, when you comfort somebody in the homeless shelter, when you feed a hungry child, your hands are the hands of God. When you march for peace in Ukraine or for reproductive rights or racial equality or Israel's security, your feet are the feet of God. As Heschel said in Selma, I felt like my feet were praying. And when you turn your eyes to injustice that others would rather ignore, your eyes are the eyes of God. And when you listen where others would turn away, your ears are the ears of God. And when you speak out against hatred and intolerance and bigotry in accordance with your conscience, your voice is the voice of God. When you work day in and day out to do all of this, your work is God's work here on earth. And that is the work we Jews are called to do. And to that call, we know there's only one answer a Jew can give. He named, here I am. Here I am, here we are, each of us, all of us, part of this great people, heirs, not, uh, heirs to a tradition and a commitment to justice that is our richest blessing. May you go from strength to strength in this wonderful congregation, menders of this fractured planet, defenders of a noble faith, until all of us together, because of what we have done, shall see the day when justice shall well up like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And we shall indeed have created for our children the world they so richly deserve. Amen. Amen. Yes, Kayach. <laughs>